So we're going to be starting chapter 11 now. This is the first part for it. There should be a total of three parts for chapter 11. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me directly at my Gmail. You can find that in the description below. If you like the video, please be sure to subscribe and also give it a thumbs up. And also please be sure to share with your friends, your classmates, uh, whoever else you think may find it useful. The nervous system, it serves to be the master control center of our body. In addition to that, it's also the main communication systems of our body. Everything that takes place in our body, it's generally speaking, it's influenced by the nervous system. So uh, if you think about your thoughts that we have, it's because of the nervous system. Uh, the actions that we do, so if we see something moving towards us, and if we decide to move towards that, or if we decide to move away from it, that's also resulting from our nervous system. Um, our emotions, this is also because of our nervous system. Uh, some of the, the functions of our uh, organs, our internal organs, how they function or at the rate that they function, it is also influenced by the nervous system. How we respond to our external stimulus, in addition to the internal stimuli uh, of our body, it's also responsible uh, because of this nervous system. And as I mentioned earlier, the nervous system is also the main communication system of the body. What allows this to happen is that the cells that make up the nervous systems, they have the ability to communicate with one another via electrical and chemical signals. Now these electrochemical impulses, they are specific and they occur at a very high rate of speed. And this usually brings about an immediate response. The nervous system has three overlapping functions, which are sensory input, integration, and motor output. So what are these things? What does it mean? What do they do? How do they work? Well, let's take a look at this now. So for the very first one, what we have to realize is that throughout our body, we have millions and millions of these sensory receptors, and they're going about detecting changes, both internally and externally. Now, when it receives these input, this data, it takes it and it sends it to number two, which is this integration center of the body. And it's over here that that information is processed and is interpreted, and it gets decided as to what the response should be. Next is that integration center will send another signal by way of this motor output. In other words, it's sending signals to an effector organ. And these effector organs, they're usually muscles or glands. And they go about producing some type of a, a response. So if you think about it, if we look at this example that, that's seen over here, uh, we see a glass of water, all right? And so how do we see it with? We see it with our eye. So our eye is a sensory receptor, and the sensory input is this water. Now, when we see this glass of water or this vase of water, uh, this data, this sensory input, gets sent to our brain. Then the brain decides, oh, this is water. Water is safe. Water is good. Water should be drunk. So what do we do? What does the brain do? It sends a signal to the muscles in the arm, okay? This is this motor output. So actually, this second part that I just told you, as this brain is deciding what to do, that's the integration. Okay? Now, then, when the brain decides what should be done, this is the motor output. In other words, when it sends a signal to the muscles of the arm, telling your arm to go and lift up that glass and bring it towards your mouth, that's the integration part. Now, although we only have a single nervous system, we end up dividing it into two principal parts for convenience. We divide it into a CNS, which stands for central nervous system, and a PNS, which stands for peripheral nervous system. Now, the first one, the CNS, it consists of the brain and the spinal cord. And it's found on the dorsal body cavity. And your spinal cord is going to be enclosed and protected by the vertebral column. And your brain will be protected by your cranium, your skull. The job for the CNS is that this is the main integration and control center. This is the organs that receives the sensory inputs and it interprets and then it decides what to do with it. In other words, it's sending out these motor outputs. Your central nervous system is also where we get the ability to make decisions from. For our memory comes from here and our ability to think, our emotions. This all comes from the CNS. Now, the peripheral nervous system or the PNS, this is the part that's to the outside of the central nervous system. In other words, it's to the periphery. So again, if you look at the CNS, it's the central, meaning it's in the mid line of, it's in the mid axis of the body, it's in the center of your body. And the PNS is to the periphery of the mid axis 
or everything that's branching out of the central nervous system. It consists mainly of nerves that extend from the brain and the spinal cord. So we have our 12 pairs of your cranial nerves and 31 pairs of spinal nerves that come off from both these organs respectively. In this image here, we're looking at your central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Now the central nervous system, as you can see, it's in the mid-axis of the body, and we have your brain and your spinal cord. And for the peripheral nervous system, it's everything to the periphery of the central nervous system. So it's everything to the sides, and we have your cranial nerve and the spinal nerves, which are shown over here. Now, keep in mind that both the spinal cord and the, the brain is very well protected. And we have the bone that protects it. For in the case of uh, your brain, we have the, your cranium, your skull, that's protecting it. And for the spinal cord, we have all the backbones that make it up, that cover for it. So you have all the vertebrae. So how does this exit? How do these spinal nerves exit? We have what's called the intervertebral foramen. If you think back to a few chapters on the bones, we looked at these intervertebral foramen. And so this is where these spinal nerves are coming off from. And when you look over here, these swellings that you see, these are called the ganglia. And this is just an aggregation of the cell bodies of these nerve cells that, uh, that you find here. The peripheral nervous system has two main functional divisions. It has a sensory or an afferent division, and it has a motor or an efferent division. The sensory division or the afferent division, it's detecting changes. So what it does is it detects input, sensory input, from bones, from skins, from muscle, from organs, and is sending the signals to the central nervous system. Okay, so it's going away from the body and to the central nervous system. So that's, if you think about it, afferent is going away from the body. Okay, and then for the motor division, efferent, it's working in the opposite direction. You're having signals that are going away from the central nervous system, or in other words, the signals are exiting the central nervous system, and they're going to the different body parts. They're going to the skin, they're going to the muscle, they're going to the organs. Okay, so this is an easy way to remember. Afferent away from the body, and efferent, or they're exiting the central nervous system. So let's go back over here. This sensory, or the afferent division, it consists of a somatic sensory fibers and also visceral sensory fibers. The somatic sensory fibers, they're conveying impulses from your skin, your skeletal muscles, and the joints to the central nervous system. And then the visceral sensory fibers, they're conveying impulses from all the visceral organs to the central nervous system. Now, keep in mind that uh, the somatic sensory fibers, they, we are conscious of this. So if you tense up your muscles in your legs, or if you tense up your muscles in your arms, can you feel it? Yes, hopefully you can. Can you feel you're touching your skin? Yes, you can. Uh, when you move your joints, can you feel? When you're moving your, your bones, you're manipulating your joints, are you able to feel that? The answer is yes, again. So these are all conscious sensations that you're able to, to feel. For the visceral sensory fibers, we cannot feel this. We cannot consciously be alerted when these... Uh, organs are manipulated or when they're working. So for example, uh, can you feel a pancreas secreting some enzymes right now? No. Do you feel a liver secreting enzymes? No, you can't. Uh, how about your stomach? Do you feel your stomach breaking down your lunch that you ate or your breakfast? The answer again is no. So for visceral sensory fibers, we do not have, we're not conscious of the movements that are occurring over here. And this is a good thing, because if you were, we would be overloaded with sensory input, and we wouldn't be able to focus or concentrate on anything. Now, the exception to this visceral sense of fibers are is pain. So we are able to detect pain when there's something wrong with uh, these organs, any one of these organs. Uh, other than that, we don't know what's going on. We're not conscious of them. The motor or the efferent division, it's transmitting impulses from the central nervous system to the effector organs. So it's the brain and the spinal cord that's sending information out to the muscles and to the glands. Now, this is subdivided into two divisions, a somatic nervous system and an autonomic nervous system. 
Now, the somatic nervous system, we have conscious control over this, whereas the autonomic nervous system, we do not have conscious control. We're not able to control uh, the organs that it's affecting. So, again, as I said, for the somatic nervous system, the somatic nerve fibers, they're conducting impulses from the brain and the spinal cord to the skeletal muscles, to the muscles that we are able to control. So when you want to pick up a glass of water or you want to pick up that spoon or you want to pick up that pen that you're writing with right now, you're able to do so because of this somatic nervous system. The brain and the spinal cord, uh, the impulses are traveling down from there to the muscles in your arm and your fingers. And it's therefore a voluntary nervous system. We have conscious control of our skeletal muscles. Whereas the autonomic nervous system, we do not have conscious control over it. So again, it's said to be in, an involuntary nervous system. Uh, it's made up of these visceral motor nerve fibers, and it regulates smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and glands. Again, can you cause your heart to, to speed up? Can you think and tell your heart, okay, heart, start beating faster or slow down heart? You can't. We do not have this ability to do so. Can you do the same thing to the smooth muscle that's surrounding your stomach? Can you tell it, come on, stomach muscles, contract, get that food out of there, send it down into the intestines. And can you tell the intestines, work harder, come on, get rid of that food. You can't do that. We do not have that. Can you think and have your uh, pancreas contract and secrete enzymes? We cannot. Again, we don't have conscious control of the autonomic nervous system. It happens automatically. Now. The autonomic nervous system, it gets divided into two further subdivisions. And both of these subdivisions, they work in opposition, in opposition to one another. They get divided into a sympathetic and a parasympathetic division. The sympathetic nervous system, it gets activated in times of emergencies. So when you think about it, uh, if you're walking down and you're encountered by somebody who's trying to steal your money, okay, or they're trying to rob you, uh, this is when the sympathetic nervous system will kick in. And this is responsible for your fight or flight. So in other words, you're going to do two things when you're approached with danger. You're either going to fight or you're going to run away. You know, you flight. You're going to take off running. So think about the things that are happening, okay, when you are terrified, okay, when you're presented with danger. Your heart beats to, your, your heart starts to speed up, okay, your heart beats, your heart is pounding actually. You're starting to breathe very heavily also, so you get rapid, deep breaths that you're taking. In addition to that, your palms, uh, you start to sweat a lot as well. Your temperature goes up. So these uh, conditions, they happen in times of uh, stress, okay? When you're uh, feeling uh, endangered, so when you're scared, when you're excited in an emergency. Uh, also, they can happen when you're embarrassed. So when you look at sympathetic it's a stressful condition. So stress starts with the letter S, and sympathetic also starts with the letter S. So this is how I rem remember it. Stress and sympathetic, and think about what happens to your body when you're under stress, the functions that happen. Now the opposite functions, the opposite results are going to be carried on by the parasympath uh, parasympathetic division. And the parasympathetic is known as the rest and digest. And when you're eating, and you're digesting the food, and when you're resting, you're typically at Peace. Okay, P starts with the letter P, and so does parasympathetic. Both start with P. So when you're at peace, what's going to happen is your heart is not going to be racing. It's going to be slowing down. So the parasympathetic system, it's going to slow down the heart. It's going to slow down your breathing. It's not going to cause you uh, your. It's not going to. It's going to deactivate the sweat glands. You're not going to be sweating. Uh, so they have opposite effects of, of one another. This flowchart summarizes what we discussed so far. So we have your CNS and we have the PNS. Again, the central nervous system consists of your brain and your spinal cords. And we said that this is the main control center of the body. It's the integrative center of the body. And the peripheral nervous system, which consists of your cranial nerves, your 12 pairs of cranial nerves and 31 pairs of spinal nerves, it uh, acts as a communication lines between the central nervous system and the rest of our body. Now, the peripheral nervous system, it's it gets broken down or subdivided into a sensory division and a motor division. The sensory or the afferent division, it's sending impulses from the body to the central nervous system. And the motor division, it's sending impulses from the CNS to the rest of the body. 
So when you look at this term over here, sensory or afferent, afferent means away. So the impulse is like going away from the body. And when you look at efferent, efferent starts with the letter E. E, uh, the word exit also starts with the letter E. So these electrical impulses, they're exiting the central nervous system, okay, and they're going to the muscles and the glands of the body. They're going to the effectors, the effector organs. So again, E is for exit, E is for effector organs, and E is for exit. So efferent signals going out of or exiting the central nervous system. And afferent, they're going away from the body to the central nervous system. Now, this motor division or the efferent division, it gets further subdivided into a somatic and an autonomic uh, nervous system. The somatic nervous system, we have conscious control of it. We have voluntary control of it. And we're, uh, the, the electrical impulses, they're going from the uh, central nervous system to skeletal muscles. So we have control of our skeletal muscles. We can think about uh, picking up a bottle of water and we can do it. We think about it, we look at the bottle of water and we're able to do this. For the autonomic nervous system, this consists of uh, visceral motor neurons. So in other words, this is involuntary. We do not have control of this. The impulses are going from the central nervous system to smooth muscles, okay, to the visceral, uh, uh, the visceral organs. The visceral organs, they're lined with smooth muscles. We do not have control of that. In addition to that, glands as well. Again, we don't have control of uh, your heart muscle, your smooth muscle, or the glands. So if you think about it, just by simply thinking, you're not able to speed up your heart, or you're not able to slow down your heart. You're not able to uh, have your glands secrete, for example, your pancreas. You can't make your pancreas secrete its enzymes. Uh, same thing with the, the smooth muscles that are uh, wrapped around your, your, uh, your intestines. You can't think about or you know, having them contract and have them contract. Uh, you can't uh, you know, stimulate peristalsis. You don't have any control of that. The, so again, that's part of your autonomic nervous system. Now the autonomic nervous system, it gets further divided into a sympathetic and a parasympathetic division. The sympathetic division, uh, it mobilizes your body's systems during activity. So the sympathetic, it's also part of your fight or flight. So when you're under stress, okay, this is uh, what's going to be kicking in. So the sympathetic system, it's going to speed up your heart rate. It's going to speed up your breathing, um, your it's going to uh, initiate sweating also, so you, you know, you're going to start sweating. Uh, so think about what happens during periods of emergencies. Uh, when you're frightened, your sympathetic division is what's kicking in. Now, the opposite is going to be your parasympathetic division. The parasympathetic division, it's doing the exact opposite of the sympathetic. So instead of speeding up the heart rate, it's going to be slowing it down. So this is part of what we call the rest and digest. So think about when you're resting, you're at peace. The letter P, uh, uh, P starts with the letter P, and parasympathetic also starts with the letter P. So this is how I, well, the, some of these tricks that I use to help uh, remember, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic s starts with S, S also starts with stress. So think about the things that happen to your body when you're under stress. And parasympathetic starts with the letter P, the word peace also starts with the letter P. And think about what happens when you're at peace, when you're serene. So the, the, the effector organs of the autonomic sy uh, nervous system, they're innervated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. The other interesting thing that I wanted to mention is when you're looking at these organs okay, of the, that this autonomic nervous system innervates. So for example, you know, your, uh, your GI tract, okay, your alimentary uh, tract, it exhibits intrinsic automatic, uh, automaticity activity. So what this means is that even when your brain is not functioning, okay, so when you're looking at person, somebody that's brain dead, guess what? Their um, intestines are still functioning, okay? It has its own ability to regulate its activities. In other words, it has its own nervous system, your uh, GI tract, as a lot of these other organs do. So, again, this is called intrinsic activity. Now, uh, same thing with the heart. The heart will still beat without the brain, okay? It will beat on its own. Think about when somebody's in a coma or when, when somebody's brain dead. The heart continues to beat. However, what the brain does, it influences 
the rate okay of contraction of your heart or it influences the uh, the, the rate of contraction of your breathing under different circumstances different situations as well as again it can influence the motility of your alimentary canal of your GI tract so uh, keep that in mind it's this again it's a it's, it's a amazing system uh, your your nervous system again we haven't figured out scientists haven't figured out exactly how uh, the nervous system works uh, perhaps out of a hundred percent we know maybe anywhere from between 10 to 15 percent that's about it there's still so much we don't know about uh, your central nervous system now in addition to this diagram I created my own flow chart uh, if you'd like to look at that uh, look for this uh, you can click on the link that's uh, over here uh, in addition to that, I'll leave it in the description below. So if you want to watch this entire uh, video first, this lecture, and then come back to it, you know, you can do that as well. Now, we're going to be taking a look at the histology of nervous tissue. So nervous tissue, it's primarily made up of two types of cells. They're made up of neurons and neuroglia. The neurons or the nerve cells, these are the cells that are excitable and the, one, the cells that are transmitting the electrical signals. The neuroglia, these are the supporting cells. Uh, they're also known as glial cells. They're much smaller cells compared to the neurons, and they surround and they wrap these delicate neurons. In the central nervous system, we have four different types of glial cells. We have astrocytes, microglia, ependymal cells, and oligodendrocytes. Like neurons, most of these glial cells, they have these branching processes in addition to a central cell body. Now these neuroglia, they're easily distinguished uh, between a neuron in that when we stain them, they appear to be much darker than the uh, neurons are. In addition to that, their size, as we mentioned earlier, are much smaller than the neurons. Additionally, these glial cells are far more numerous than neurons are. There are actually about 10 times more uh, glial cells than there are neurons. So they make up roughly half of the mass of your brain. So the first type of glial cell that we're going to be looking at are the astrocytes. When you look at an astrocyte, we see that they have these highly branched extensions. And because of this, it gives them this star-shaped appearance, which is how they come up with this name, astrocyte. Astrocyte means star-like or star cell. So these highly branched extensions that they have, they cling on to neurons, synaptic endings, and capillaries. Astrocytes function to support and brace the neurons and anchoring them to the nutrient supply lines, which are the blood capillaries. They also play a role in making the exchanges between capillaries and neurons by helping to determine the capillary permeability in the guiding and migration of young neurons and in synapse formation. Astrocytes also control the chemical environment around neurons where they pick up leaked potassium ions and they recycle the released neurotransmitters. They've also been shown to respond to nearby nerve impulses and release neurotransmitters. Astrocytes are connected to one another by gap junctions and they are able to signal each other by taking in calcium and creating slow-paced intracellular calcium pulses. In addition to that, they are also able to release extracellular chemical messengers. Recent research also suggests that astrocytes participate in information processing in the brain. And in this image here, we have this astrocyte and notice the formation of this. So as you can see, all these little extensions that are coming off it, it helps give this kind of a, a star-shaped uh, appearance, which is how this cell gets its name, astrocyte or star cell. Um, and here's a neuron over here, so you can see it clinging on to the neuron in addition to these blood capillaries. Microglial cells are these small ovoid cells that have these long thorny processes. These processes, they touch and monitor nearby neurons. When the microglial cell detects that a, a cell is in danger or it's been injured or when its health is in decline, it has the ability to migrate towards these neurons. At that point, this cell, microglial cell, has the ability to transform into a macrophage. Now, this macrophage has the ability to phagotize the dead neuron or any other microorganisms in addition to any neural debris that may be present. This protective role of the microglia is very important because the cells of our immune system, they're not able to come into the central nervous system because of the blood-brain barrier. In this image, you can see a microglial cell, and you can see these long, thorny extensions that it has, and uh, where it's making contact with uh, multiple neurons. In this case, we're seeing uh, two neurons that, it, that it's, uh, this one cell is monitoring. So again, this is a very important cell uh, in its ability uh, as an immune cell uh, for the central nervous system. Ependema cells, they range in shape from being squamous shaped to column shaped. Many of these cells are also ciliated. The cilia is there to beat and circulate the cerebrospinal fluid. 
They line the central cavities of the brain and spinal cord where they form a fairly permeable barrier between the cerebrospinal fluid that fills those cavities and the tissue fluid that's bathing the cells of the central nervous system. In this image, we can see these ependymal cells and notice that these are column shaped. And then you have the, the cilia that's over here that's beating this uh, fluid that's uh, up over here. So it's cerebral spinal fluid that is circulating. And on the other end, it's lining this, uh, it, this could be brain tissue or it could be spinal cord tissue. Oligodendrocytes also have processes, but they're far fewer than what we've seen in microglia and the astrocytes. These cells, they line up along the thicker neuron fibers in the central nervous system, and they wrap their processes tightly around the fibers, producing an insulating cover called the myelin sheath. In this image here, we can see this oligodendrocyte, and this is a cell body, and this is the nucleus. These are the processes that are coming off of this oligodendrocyte, and you can see these nerve fibers over here, which are in yellow. And you can see that the processes that are coming off these oligodendrocytes, they completely wrap themselves around these uh, nerve fibers, forming this insulative myelin sheath. So those are the four neuroglia that we see in the central nervous system. Now we're going to be talking about the two neuroglia that we see in the peripheral nervous system. So the two major neuroglia that we have in the PNS are satellite cells and Schwann cells. Now satellite cells, we see them surrounding neuron cell bodies in the PNS. Uh, their function is similar to that of what we've seen in the astrocytes of the central nervous system. Schwann cells, which are also called neuroli myocytes, they surround all peripheral nerve fibers and form this myelin sheath in the thicker nerve fibers. This is similar to what we've seen in the oligodendrocytes of the CNS. Now, these Schwann cells, they're vital to the regeneration of damaged peripheral nerve fibers. So one of the abilities that these Schwann cells uh, has is to help uh, regenerate damaged nerve fibers. So in this image here, you can see the satellite cell, which is surrounding the cell body of a neuron. And then here we have these Schwann cells, which are forming these myelin sheets uh, around this, uh, the thicker nerve fibers. Nerve cells, which are also known as neurons, are the structural units of the nervous system. In our body, in our brain, we have over 100 billion neurons. Now these large, highly specialized cells, they have the ability to conduct nerve impulses from one body part to another. Aside from that, they also have the following special characteristics. They have the ability to last a person's lifetime. In other words, they're able to last over 100 years provided you receive adequate nutrition and you abstain from drugs and other toxic substances. The other thing is that after the age of two, neurons are amitotic. In other words, they stop dividing after age two. There are a couple of exemptions wherein the olfactory epithelium and some hippocampal regions contain stem cells that can produce new neurons throughout your life. Now, some people ask, well, what about in, as we're learning new things, when we're in school, when we're in college, and we're constantly learning new things? Doesn't the number of neurons increase? Don't, doesn't our brain, brain grow more? The answer is no. The number of neurons, again, they stop increasing after age two. Again, these neurons are amitotic after the age of two. So what happens then? As you're learning more and more new, uh, new things, as you're learning more information, the number of connections between the neurons increase, but not the number of neurons itself. Neurons are an energy hog. They have a very high metabolic rate, so they require a continuous supply of oxygen and glucose. As you may know, without more than a few minutes of oxygen, four minutes, maybe five to seven minutes in a well-trained person, nerve cells will start to die. All neurons, they have a cell body and they have one or more processes. The plasma membrane of neurons is the site of electrical signaling, and it plays a crucial role in cell-to-cell -cell interactions that occur during development. The cell body of the neuron is also referred to as the perikaryon or the soma. Depending on who you're speaking with, they may use any one of these three terms. This is also the main biosynthetic center of the neuron. So you're going to have proteins being synthesized, membranes, and chemicals also. We also find organelles such as your rough endoplasmic reticulum, the rough ER. We'll find free ribosomes floating around. You'll find mitochondria and Golgi apparatus, among others. When you look at a cell body and you see this dark staining region, which is also called this chromatophilic substance, these are what's called the nissel bodies. And what this is are areas where you have a high aggregation of rough endoplasmic reticulum and free ribosomes. We we'll also see a spherical nucleus along with this nucleolus that's present. In some cell bodies, we see an accumulation of pigment that's present, which is called lipofusion. 
This lipofusion is a harmless byproduct of liposomal activity. Sometimes it's called the aging pigment because you tend to see this accumulate in neurons of elderly individuals. In most neurons, the plasma membrane of the cell body also acts as part of the receptor region that receives information from other neurons. Most of the cell bodies of the neurons are located within the central nervous system. Where we find clusters of neuron cell bodies in the CNS, we refer to them as nuclei. Where we have clusters of neuron cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system, we call them ganglia. So in this image here, we're looking at a nerve cell. So this is a typical neuron. So right over here, what we have are the dendrites. Okay, this is one of the extensions of uh, the nerve cell. And then this area over here, this long tail-like extension, is called the uh, axon. Okay, so here are the two uh, extensions of this nerve cell. And this is a cell body over here. And you can see the mitochondria, the rough ER, uh, the, uh, you can see some ribosomes also that are floating about. Um, and what you see over here, this high aggregation of these rough ER and the, the free ribosomes is what makes up this nasal body. This is what we call the nasal body over here, uh, or the chromatophilic substance. So when an action potential is going to be traveling through this nerve cell, it's going to enter through these dendrites over here, through this region, then it's going to travel through the cell body, and then it's going to exit through this axon. So this is the path the electrical impulse will travel through. So when you look over here, these are these Schwann cells, and you can see them insulating this axon uh, by forming this myelin sheath. When we take a closer look at dendrites, we find that motor neurons can have hundreds of these short, tapering, diffusely branching processes. These are the main receptive regions of the neurons, meaning that electrical signals, they're coming to this neuron by way of these processes, by way of the dendrites. From there, from these dendrites, the electrical impulse will next travel to the cell body. And again, so when this happens, we call this a graded potential. This isn't an electrical impulse at this point. This is not a nerve impulse or an action potential that's generated, but it's just a graded potential or a short distance signal. In many brain areas, the finer dendrites are highly specialized for information collection. They have thorny appendages with bulbous or spiky ends that are called dendritic spines. This represents these fine points of close contact or the synapses with other neurons. In this picture here, you can see this neuron. This is the cell body of the neuron. You can see the dendrites here. And over here, you can see these fine dendritic spine. Now let's take a closer look at the structure of the axon. Now each neuron, it has a single axon. It exits the cell body and it starts at this cone-shaped area that we call the axon hillock. In some neurons, the axon is very short or is absent. In others, it could account for nearly the entire length of the neuron. So it's quite long. So, for the example, when you look at the motor neurons that are controlling skeletal muscles of your great toe, it extends from the lumbar region of your spine all the way down to your foot. This is anywhere from between 3 to 4 feet in length. This makes them the longest cells in the body. These long axons is what we call nerve fibers. While each neuron has only a single axon, it could have occasional branches along their length. These branches are called axon collaterals. The axon collaterals, they extend from the axon at more or less right angles. Whether an axon is undivided or it has collaterals, it usually branches profusely at its ends, or its terminus. 10,000 or more terminal branches or teledendria per neuron is not unusual. These knob-like distal endings of the terminal branches are sometimes called axon terminals, synactive knobs, or boutons. Functionally, the axon is a conducting region of the neuron. It generates nerve impulses and transmits them, typically away from the cell body, along the plasma membrane, or the axolemma. In motor neurons, the nerve impulse is generated at the junction of the axon hillock and axon, and conducted along the axon to the axon terminals, which are the secretary regions of the neuron. When the impulse reaches the axon terminal, it causes the neurotransmitter stored in the vesicles there to be released into the extracellular space. Because each neuron receives signals from and sends signals to scores of other neurons, it's able to carry on conversations with many different neurons at the same time. Axons lack the structures that are involved with protein synthesis and packaging. Consequently, an axon depends on its cell body to renew the necessary proteins and membrane components. In addition to that, it also relies on efficient transport mechanisms to distribute them. Axons will quickly decay if they're cut or severely damaged. Because axons are often very long, the task of moving molecules along their entire length may appear to be difficult. However, through cooperative efforts of several types of cytoskeletal elements, including microtubules, actin filaments, etc., etc., substances they travel continuously along the axon, both away from and towards the cell body. 
Movements towards the axon terminal is referred to as anterograde movement, while movements towards the cell body is referred to as retrograde movement. Substances that are moved in the anterograde direction include mitochondria, cytoskeletal elements, membrane components, and enzymes. Substances that are moved retrogradely include organelles to be degraded, signal molecules, viruses, and bacterial toxins. Certain viruses and bacterial toxins that damage neural tissues, they use retrograde axonal transport to reach the cell body. This transport mechanism has been demonstrated for polio, rabies, herpes simplex virus, and tetanus toxins. It's used as a tool to treat genetic diseases by introducing viruses containing corrected genes or microRNA to suppress defective genes is under investigation. Most nerve fibers, especially those that are long or large in diameter, they're covered with a myelin sheath. The myelin sheath is made up of myelin, which is a whitish, protein lipid substance. Myelin functions to protect and electrically insulate the axons. In addition to that, it also speeds up nerve transmission. Myelinated fibers, where we have axons that are surrounded by this myelin sheath, are able to transmit impulses quite quickly, quite rapidly. Whereas where we have non-myelinated fibers, these are axons that do not have this uh, myelin sheath, they conduct impulses more slowly. In the peripheral nervous system, the myelin sheath is formed by Schwann cells. Now, these Schwann cells, they indent to receive an axon, and then they wrap themselves around it in what's described as a jelly roll fashion. Initially, the wrapping is loose, but the Schwann cell cytoplasm is gradually squeezed from between the membrane layers. When the wrapping process is complete, many concentric layers of Schwann cell plasma membranes, they enclose the axon. So if you think about it, if you were to injure your finger and you were to take gauze and wrap it around it, this is kind of what, like what's uh, occurring over here. The thickness of the myelin sheet depends on the number of spirals it forms. The other thing to note is that one cell forms one segment of myelin sheet. The nucleus in most of the cytoplasm of the Schwann cell ends up as a bulge just external to the myelin sheath. This portion of the Schwann cell, which includes exposed parts of its plasma membrane, is called the outer collar of perinuclear cytoplasm, formerly known as the neurolemma. Plasma membranes of myelinating cells contain much less protein than the plasma membranes of most body cells. Channel and carrier proteins are notably absent. This is a characteristic that makes myelin sheets exceptionally good electrical insulators. Another unique characteristic of these membranes is the presence of specific protein molecules that are interlocked to form a sort of a molecular velcro between adjacent myelin membranes. So in this image here, here we have an axon. This is a Schwann cell over here. And this is the, the cell membrane of the Schwann cell. And this is the, the cytoplasm of the Schwann cell. And this is the nucleus over here of the Schwann cell. So the very first thing that you see that occurs is that this, uh, the Schwann cell it initially envelopes uh, it's this, this axon, okay? So it comes and kind of like gives it a, a light hug. The next thing it does is that it starts to wrap itself around. So the Schwann cell rotates around the axon, wrapping its plasma membrane loosely around it in successive layers. So you can see over here the, the different layers that are starting to form. As we continue, the Schwann cell cytoplasm, it's forced between the membranes. Then this is how you end up getting this tight membrane wrapping that surrounds the axon, axon forming the myelin sheets. This image here shows a cross-sectional view of a myelinated axon, which is taken from an electron micrograph at 24,000 times magnification. So you see the axon over here, and you can see the, the rings of the myelin sheet that's formed here. And here's this outer collar of the perinuclear cytoplasm of the Schwann cell that you see over here. Adjacent Schwann cells along an axon don't touch one another, so we end up having what's called these myelin sheath gaps that formed. Formerly, they were known as, as these nodes of Ranvier, and to serve as sites where axon collaterals can emerge from. In non-myelinated fibers, we have Schwann cells that surround the peripheral nerve fibers, but the coiling process doesn't occur. In this instance, a single Schwann cell is able to enclose up to 15 or more axons, each of which occupies a separate recess in the Schwann cell surface. So we're taking a look at this neuron again. So this is a dendrite, as we already know from looking at this picture before, and this is a cell body. Now, as we move forward, this area right over here, this cone-shaped region where the axon is, is forming is this axon hillock. So this is this entire region is called this axon. Now, these Schwann cells are, uh, that, are, that you find s surrounding this uh, axon form what's known as this uh, the, the myelin sheets over here. And the gaps that you see in between these adjacent uh, Schwann cells forms these nodes of Ranvier or these 
myelin sheath gaps over here and this is these are the the telodendria or the terminal branches and then you what we have over here are these axon terminals the secretory regions so which are also known as the, the synaptic knobs or the boutons in the central nervous system we find both myelinated and unmyelinated axons however what's different here is that oligodendrocytes are the cells that are forming the myelin sheet not the schwann cells as we find in the pns Oligodendrocytes have multiple flat processes that can coil around as many as 60 axons at the same time. As in the PNS, adjacent sections of the axon's myelin sheath are separated by nodes of Renvir. The CNS myelin sheaths lack an outer collar of perinuclear cytoplasm because cell extensions are doing the coiling and the squeeze out cytoplasm is forced not peripherally but back towards the centrally located nucleus. So the smallest diameter axons or the thinnest fibers, they're unmyelinated, but they're still covered by the long extensions of adjacent neuroglia. Regions of brain and spinal cord containing dense collections of myelinated fibers are referred to as white matter and are primarily fiber tracts. Gray matter contains mostly nerve cell bodies and unmyelinated fibers. So in this image over here, you can see a single oligodendrocyte has the ability to wrap up around several multiple uh, axons, multiple nerve fibers. Neurons are grouped structurally according to the number of processes extending from their cell bodies. Three major neuron groups make up this classification. We have multipolar, bipolar, and unipolar neurons. Multipolar neurons are the most common neuron types found in the human body, with more than 99% of neurons belonging to this class. Structurally, they have three or more processes, one axon and the rest are dendrites. Bipolar neurons have two processes, an axon and a dendrite, that extend from opposite sides of the cell body. These are rare neurons that are found in some of the special sense organs. So, for example, we find them in some neurons in the retina of the eye, as well as in the olfactory mucosa. Unipolar neurons have a single short process that emerges from the cell body and divides T-like into proximal and distal branches. Unipolar neurons are more accurately called pseudo-unipolar neurons because they originate as bipolar neurons. During early embryonic development, the two processes, they converge and partially fuse to form a short single process that issues from the cell body. Unipolar neurons are found chiefly in ganglia and the PNS, where they function as sensory neurons. Going back to the processes, the more distal process, which is often associated with sensory receptors, is the peripheral process whereas the one that's entering the central nervous system is the central process. So in this table over here, they're showing you the structural classes of neurons. So over here, we have the multipolar neuron over here. And remember, this is the most numerous type. 99% of the neurons in our body are multipolar. So what we have over here is, from the, cell, uh, from the cell body, we have multiple extensions that are coming off and a single axon. For the bipolar neuron, we have the cell body here, and off the cell body, we have two extensions that are coming off. We have an, a single, we have a dendrite, and we have this axon that's coming off of it. For the unipolar, or also referred, known as the pseudo-unipolar neuron type, we have the cell body that's off to the, the side, to the periphery of this axon over here. Now, when you look down over here, what we see is our, the, the relationship of the three functional regions of this uh, nerve cell in the multipolar. So this part over here, the blue, uh, the, this blue or violet color, this is the receptive region. The green region is the conducting region and the this peach uh, color is the secretary region. So when you look over here in the multipolar cell, where you have the cell body and the dendrites branching off of it, this is the receptive region. So in other words, the nerve impulses is entering to through uh, to the cell from this area right over here, okay? And then the conductor region, this is where the action potential is generated and the, the, it's, it's transmitted along. It's gonna be along this entire length of this axon. And then the secretary region is gonna be over here at this, uh, it's quite small over here, okay? In this multipolar uh, neuron type. And this is where the neurotransmitters will be released. Comparatively, when you look at the bipolar neuron type, where you have this, uh, the receptor region is quite large. Okay. It extends from the dendrites all the way to the cell body over here. This entire length is going to be this receptive region. And then when you look at the conductive, uh, the conductive uh, 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 region, it's quite small compared to both the multipolar as well as the unipolar. And then you look at the secretary region, which is, again, it's just nearly identical 
perhaps slightly smaller than uh, both the multipolar and the unipolar. But it's, it's, for all purposes, it's going to be identical. So finally, moving along to the, well, the other thing you want to look at is the conduction region. It's, it's, it's quite small as well. Okay, It's not as long as the, the uh, for the unipolar or as long as the multipolar, but somewhere right in between. And then when you look at the unipolar cell, the receptor region is going to be the shortest in this type of cell, okay? Because what you have is the entire length you have an axon. So therefore, the conduction region is going to be the longest. And then you have the secretary region, which is just about identical to the other two. This chart is showing some structural variations uh, of the three different type of uh, uh, structural cells that we looked at. So when you look at these multipolar cells, again, they're telling you this is the most abundant in the body. This is the major neuron type in the central nervous system. And they're showing you that over here, the, these are the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum, and these are the pyramidal cells. So again, you can tell this is multipolar. Here's the cell body. You have multiple extensions that are coming off of it. Then you have a single axon. Uh, and this would be a collateral axon that you see over here. Now. When you look over here, you have the same thing. This is a cell body over here. You've got multiple extensions coming off of it, and you have this single axon over here. When you look at the bipolar cell, now this is a bipolar of an olfactory cell, and this is the bipolar of a retinal cell. Again, you have the cell body, and then you have uh, two processes that are coming off of it. You have the dendrite, and then you have an axon. Same thing over here. You have a shorter dendrite here, and you have a longer axon over here in this one. But again, you have two poles. You have two processes that are extending from the cell body. Then when you come over here, you look at this unipolar cell. This is the dorsal root ganglion. Uh, and you see the cell body over here. And then you have this single long axon that we see here, the central process over here. And these are going to be the dendrites over here. And the terminal end is going to be on this side down over here. So again, keep in mind that these are the, the most rare of the cell types, these bipolar. And then as for the unipolar, we're going to find them mainly in your peripheral nervous system. They're common only in the dorsal root ganglia of the spinal cord and the sensory ganglia of the cranial nerves. For the functional classification of neurons, we group the neurons according to the direction in which the nerve impulses are traveling relative to the central nervous system. Based on this criterion, we have sensory motor neurons, and interneurons. For sensory neurons, the impulses are transmitting from the sensory receptors towards the central nervous system. So again, the impulses are going away from the body and to the CNS, to the central nervous system, to the brain and spinal cord. With the exception of your spe some of the special sense organs, all the cells, they're, uh, structurally, they're all unipolar. The cell bodies, they're located in ganglia in the peripheral nervous system. So only the most distal parts of these unipolar neurons, they act as impulse receptor sites. And the peripheral processes are often very long. So the example is uh, the fibers that are carrying sensory impulses from the skin of your great toe that travels for more than three to four feet before they reach the cell bodies in the ganglion close to the spinal cord. Motor neurons are carrying impulses from the central nervous system to the effectors. In shape, these are multipolar. Most of the cell bodies are located in the central nervous system, with the exception of some autonomic neurons. One other thing that I want to mention is that sensory neurons are also referred to as afferent neurons, and motor neurons are also referred to as efferent neurons. So keep that in mind. This is an excellent test question that you're likely to see on exams. Lastly, we have interneurons, which are also referred to as association neurons. They lie between motor and sensory neurons in the neural pathways, and they shuttle signals throughout the central nervous system pathways where integration occurs. Most interneurons, they're confined within the central nervous system. They make up over 99% of the neurons of the body, including most of those that are in the CNS. Almost all the interneurons, they're multipolar, but there is considerable diversity in both their size and the fiber branching patterns. So in this image over here, it's, uh, we have a table here that's a, a comparison of the structural classes of neurons. So what we can see here is that for both unipolar and bipolar uh, neuron types, these are both sensory neurons. Uh, so you have uh, information going from different body parts to uh, the CNS. Uh, in the case of bipolar, which are very rare, we find them in special sensory organs, such as olfactory and the eye. And then in the case of multipolar neurons, uh, 
mostly we're going to find multipolar neurons as motor neurons. So they're conducting impulses uh, from the central nervous system to the effector organs. And that's it for the first part of chapter 11. If you like this video, please smash the thumbs up button. Also, please be sure to share with your friends, your classmates, and anybody else that you think may find it helpful. Uh, additionally, please be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you have any questions, please email me directly. I prefer that. Sometimes I'm not able to reply to you guys back in the, in the comments area below for whatever reason. Uh, again, you can find my email address in the description below. And thank you so much for watching.